Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us on Health Professional Radio. In this segment, we're going to have a conversation with returning guest, Dr. Larry Edwards. Now, Dr. Edwards is Professor of Medicine, Division of Rheumatology and Clinical Immunology, Program Director and Vice Chairman of the Department of Medicine at the University of Florida in Gainesville, also Chairman of the Gout Education Society. Now, Larry is returning to talk about the ongoing challenges that he's seen in making sure that doctors and patients understand the latest guidelines in gout management. Welcome back, Larry. How have you been? I've been great, Neil, and thank you for having me on again. It's always a pleasure. Well, I told our, our listeners about your, your position there at the uh, University of Florida in Gainesville, your chairmanship at the Gout Education Society. Let's jump right in and, and give our listeners who may not be familiar with gout a general overview of the condition. Uh, gout is a form of inflammatory arthritis, uh, sort of like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis that you see over your TV screens all these days with various medications to treat it. But gout is actually the most common form of inflammatory arthritis, and it's caused by an elevation of uric acid uh, in the body. And when the levels advance over normal, in that increases your chance of forming uric acid crystals in and around the joints. And it's these crystals that over time accumulate and trigger the flares that are the, the very common presentation of gout, this excruciating pain usually in one or two joints, usually in the lower extremity that incapacitates the, the sufferer for anywhere from five up to eight or nine days uh, oh. where they really are confined. And over time, these accumulations of uric acid um, actually destroy the bone and cartilage around the, the joint so that it results in a chronic uh, crippling type of arthritis. How many people are suffering from gout? Is this something that's considered rare or is it relatively common? Uh, it's a common disease. Uh, about 4% of adults in the United States suffer from gout. That's 5% of men and about 3% of women. Um, uh, estimation uh, on the most recent taking of the NHANES data, the nationwide survey, uh, put the number at about 9.2 million people in this country. It uh, has a, uh, a high prevalence of other metabolic problems. We consider gout a metabolic disease um, because of this increased level of uric acid, but it's associated with a lot of other components of the metabolic syndrome, such as hypertension, uh, insulin resistance, diabetes, uh, hyperlipidemias, um, chronic kidney disease, and, and coronary artery disease as well. If gout has an association with all of these other very common maladies as well, does it require lifelong management? Is this something that you can just manage when it pops up? I know diabetes, that's lifelong. Hypertension, lifelong. Does gout fall into that category as well? Right, and lipid abnormalities are usually lifelong as well. Hmm. Uh, yes, it is, uh, and that's one of the great misunderstandings, certainly by the lay public, but also by some physicians, that they just treat the symptoms, um, and that does the patient no good because the disease is going to continually progress. Getting gout under control by lowering the serum uric acid level is uh, what you want to do for the life of the patient. Uh, it, over time, will eliminate the flares and eliminate this um, destructive arthritis. In speaking with you and other your, your colleagues, I understand that it's very important to become an, an advocate of your own health care. But many of us, the vast majority of, of us, depend on our physician to tell us, you know, what's what. If physicians are either unfamiliar with the treatment landscape or the options or the requirements, I don't really expect the patient to be more so. That's absolutely correct. Uh, and it's why we started the, the Gout Education Society, which is a web-based uh, education. Uh, initially, when we started it almost 15 years ago, it was to kind of bypass the physicians because we were having a heck of a time um, getting them to ad adhere to the gout treatment guidelines mm -hmm. uh, from any professional organization. But we thought if we put it out there of uh, what the expected uh, types of therapies would be for people suffering from gout, that they could be their own advocates. Uh, we do have a professional side on that as well to educate 
uh, healthcare professionals up uh, on what the latest uh, guidelines are in appropriate therapies. You know, guidelines change quite quite frequently for different uh, different compounds, different diseases, different uh, treatments. Uh, are these guidelines identical across the board? I mean, in the United States, in Europe, Australia, if a, if a physician decides to practice in, in a different locale, are they going to be either adhering to or rejecting the exact same guidelines? No, actually, the United States guidelines um, and the European guidelines, uh, the United States ones are uh, put out by the uh, American College of Rheumatologists, and the European ones are put out by the uh, by ULAR, which is the European League Against Rheumatism. Um, they are pretty much in lockstep as far as what the overriding uh, theory is, and that is a treat-to-target uh, mode. So our target for everybody with uric acid uh, elevation is to get their uric acid level down below six. At that level, crystals no longer form from uric acid in the blood. Um, and over time, if you keep the uric acid below six, crystals that are already existent will slowly dissolve and melt away. And so the Europeans and the Americans uh, are pretty much in lockstep with that. There are some subtle differences uh, throughout their guidelines. Um, the American College of Rheumatology guidelines suggest a target of less than six. Um, the Europeans are a little more aggressive and say less than five or six. And I think that most people that treat a lot of gout really shoot for at least less than five. Um, there are some differences in what they consider first-line drugs. Uh, they have two drugs in the First line category allopurinol and fibusostat, whereas the American College of Rheumatology supports uh, allopurinol being the first line. And if that's not effective or the patient can't tolerate it, then go into fibusostat for them. Um, there are some other uh, subtle differences um, uh, about uh, when to start the drugs. Uh, the Europeans are a little more aggressive. If you have one attack of gout, it's time to get on a uric acid lowering drug, according to their guidelines. Um, and the Americans, on the other hand, um, they say uh, after the second attack is the right time to do it. Well, for most patients, that's going to be within a year of the first attack. So it's a little subtle difference. But again, the overriding push from both groups is that um, we treat the target and that we that the patient stays on these therapies uh, forever. Talk about how the stigma and misconception of gout is one of the main challenges when it comes to adhering to treatment or even, you know, seeking treatment in the first place on the patient side as well as the physician. That's a great question, Neil, and one that we've just recently started approaching. Uh, we had a research project that we presented at the European um, League Against Rheumatism uh, just this year on biases uh, to patients with gout by physicians and biases of the general public about the disease gout. Uh, it suffers from the same type of, of bias and uh, that uh, other chronic illnesses like uh, obesity, um, even type 2 diabetes because it's associated with obesity. Um, that uh, the, the patients and the general public feel that gout is a self-inflicted disease, something that uh, is caused by their overindulgences of certain foods or too much alcohol or, or whatever, but it's the patient's fault. And it's the reason that a lot of patients don't come in. It's out of embarrassment uh, that they think that the doctor is only going to tell them to lose weight and stop eating or drinking these things that they like to eat or drink. Mm -hmm. um, and rather than getting to the heart of the matter, and the, that gout, uh, like obesity, is predominantly driven by genetics, uh, that the diet uh, is a relatively small component of the factors that enter into gout. Uh, and it's not appreciated, certainly, by the general public. And to our surprise, <laughs> Uh, when we did this study on 106 rheumatologists uh, just testing uh, their subtle um, biases against different types of patients, 
those with gout um, suffered poorly uh, as far as uh, physicians thinking that the patients weren't going to be taking their drugs as prescribed, that they were, in fact, responsible for a good part of their own suffering because of this. And we have to overcome those biases, not just in gout, but in all diseases. Larry, give us a website where our listeners can learn more. Sure. Uh, the Gout Education Society is at www.goutteducation.org. Uh, and again, we have both the the uh, patient side of it as well as the health professional side of that. Uh, and both of them are very informative. Larry, always a pleasure. I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much for being a contributor here at Health Professional Radio. Thank you, Neil. Always a pleasure. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with returning guest, Dr. Larry Edwards. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.